and uh, went to Texas A and M. This I was in the Texas at the time, and I sought help from their ag extension, and they started giving me all this really cool information about beneficial nematodes that ate the larva, the fag worms, and what ate what, and it, and it became just a, a really neat passion of mine to be able to take it out into my gardens. And uh, one of the curious things, not to go to today age, the other nemesis in this house, it was uh, built in the 40s, or like 41 or 42, was the paper wasp, the yellow jacket. And uh, they were, you know, underneath the eggs, and it was a problem. I had, I was starting a family, in it, and I was always having a bunch of youngsters over, shocker, you know, check all those boxes. And um, I quickly learned that there are the bag worms that we have up here that are that love pecan trees. That's their number one food source. The yellow jacket loves bag worms. And so that was a leap of faith to be able to take uh, the bag worms or the yellow jackets, move these paper nests, keep them in the yard, and let them do their thing. And it works. And then I started working with okay, well, I bought the house from the original owners. And I have uh, decomposed pecans in this lawn. Like it took me three hours to cut the grass the first time. This is a corner lot in the city. It's not an enormous piece of property. And so how do I get rid of and, and work with you know the roaches and everything else that's living in this tall grass that's supposed to be a lawn? And again, I was pushed towards nematodes. And then specifically, the general term would be a beneficial nematode. There's nematodes that attach themselves to particular root systems and things like that that are not beneficial. Uh, but there are and there are nematodes that eat ant, flea, tick, larva, uh, chiggers, all this stuff in their youth. And so you can literally take this these uh, dry nematode eggs, hydrate them and pour them on fire ant mounds and all kinds of stuff. And you just watch them go away. So it would take them a short while. If you kept the soil moist, they would just eat every all of that stuff. And again, you could go out in your own yard with your flip-flops on and not get tore up. Big, big help. About the same time, I was, uh, well, it's off and on as a seasonal worker, I would go out and throw hay for some of these ranchers and stuff like that. And uh, we were cutting cedar, uh, throwing hay out in these fields, never going to the bathroom. I mean, literally just drinking gallons of water and it just coming out of your pores. You know, it never got through your system. And we found that uh, pyrethrin, which is a uh, extract from the chrysanthemum, was what we used on ourselves. We uh, sprayed it on our legs. We sprayed it around our waist. Basically, when you're getting dressed, uh, you're misting yourself down with um, a pyrethroid, which would be either a synthetic blend of a pyrethrum um, to get it on your skin so that you wouldn't taste good for these critters. Fast forward, it's very popular in a lot of these. And I'm a big fan because of the lack of side effects for humans. It'll kill a lot of bugs contact wise. But as far as the effect, long term effect on people, it's just not there. And now biologically, they can prove why. We just knew it worked and we knew we didn't get sick when we used it. Nobody broke out in rashes. And uh, it's nothing like having a line of tips, you know, where your underwear is. You have to only one time uh, pulling those off of you. So you realize, yeah, I'll go to spray myself. So uh, that's some of that's been incorporated into some of the offs and things like that. There's also folklore that's that's uh, born out of paranoia and fear uh, to stop use of particular poisons that are actually not harmful to it's human beings or other vertebrates. And one of the most popular uh, misrepresented is DEET. And uh, they used to smoke, you know, small towns with swampy areas with DEET to uh, keep the mosquitoes down. Well, they, um, the, the blood-borne diseases from the mosquitoes is a lot worse than a rash that you might get from DEET. Uh, the chiggers and things like that that bite you and then or bite a rat and then bite you 
uh, the, the transfer of diseases, malarias, and all these other kinds of things that come from mosquitoes that are carrying blood when they're biting you. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. So you don't get three headed frogs and monsters don't come out of the swamp and stuff like that. But the lack of knowledge, truth will set you free. So do your homework. Uh, when in doubt, instead of reading the folklore scary stuff, get into some of the people that are actually doing the science on it that don't have a, a, a dog in the hunt, as we would say. Going all the way back to the beginning of your garden, but I want to start with the thought that a healthy plant is a safer plant. You want to keep yourself from getting molds, keep yourself from being affected by the bugs. The bugs are always there. The molds are always there. Some of these bacteria are very beneficial, and I'll get into that. But you start with your soil and how to make it if you want to make it and how to water it when you're watering it. So you want to make sure that up here, specifically for our area, uh, we did not have a forest up until recently. It's very difficult, unusual, to find a, a tree that's a couple hundred years old. There are a few, but for the most part, all of this area burnt to the ground or the buffalo and antelope ate it all. There's some trees that made it, but for the most part, we do not have a thousand years or 300 years of forest litter that creates the organic material in the soil. We have decomposed granite in multiple stages of its decomposition. Some of it is a little more coarse, and it's just the DG that you will pay someone to bring in to spread in your yard to walk around on. And some of it's a little bit uh, closer to sand. It breaks down and breaks down and breaks down, and you end up with clay, which is then almost dust. And it's rubbing together. It creates a static electricity of sorts that binds it. What breaks that apart is the organic material. Humic acid is created with inside of mulch. And so your mulch is, becomes a very important component. And I wanna make a distinction between your mulch and your um, top dressing or your wood chips. Granite, gravel can be considered mulch in the sense that it keeps the ground cool and uh, creates a barrier for a, a lack of evaporation, but it's not gonna decompose in our lifetime. Wood chips, cedar bark, pine bark, or decorative stuff, um, you're gonna, you can damage your yard and your plants by using what we call green or uncooked materials. We're not putting them in the oven, we're not boiling them or anything like that. It happens naturally. They grab nitrogen, which is where the damage comes to your plants, out of the ground or out of the plants that they surround, to break down, they actually heat up. You will see them steam. If you have a big mulch pile in your yard, you can see it steam on cool nights. That chemical reaction is taking nitrogen out of the ground, wherever they can find it, setting it on fire uh, and breaking it down. Then it re-releases the nitrogen. So be careful. Would I use wood chips from uh, over by the Humane Society frequently. And I use them as a ground cover to keep my weeds from coming up. But I know laying them down, I'll put three or four inches down. I know that putting anything in there is, is a seed. You're essentially sending it, sending it to death because when it heats up, it'll kill that seed. That's another piece of information you can use. Go ahead and put a bunch of holes out, wood chips, and uh, throw some nitrogen on top of it so it doesn't hurt your trees. If that's all you have, you see a row of maples, all of them look good except for the last two, and there's just uh, shin high wood chips. And you could, all they did was just wood chips, you know, to keep the moisture in. The thought was right, the chemicals, the materials were all right, but they left the nitrogen out. You, use, you can use a granular nitrogen, you can put fish emulsion on it. Just get some nitrogen so it doesn't take nitrogen. Um, Knowing this, that you get hot, if you're making your own soil for your garden or for your yard, you want to encourage it to get hot so that it kills the pathogens and kills the eggs that are laid in it. That's one of the safer soils that you're not going to buy bag stuff. The bag stuff that is decomposed or compost mulch is supposed to be 
cook that way and be clean. So one of the threats that you might see inside of that, and it's not uncommon, so check your bags. Uh, it's not something that happens all the time, but you might find termites in your mulch that is imported bug, and uh, you shouldn't be that afraid of it. Uh, termites aren't as common up here as they are down in Phoenix, but um, they only eat dead wood. They're not going to eat your tree. They're going to they, they'll eat the dead wood off the tree, but they're not going to eat the live trees. The termite itself is not going to kill a tree. Uh, much like whether it's fun to visualize or not, maggots don't eat flesh. They eat dead flesh. So uh, if a fly lays eggs in your wound and you're out in the middle of nowhere, let its babies do its thing. It'll leave a little enzyme behind that'll help you heal up properly, and it'll only eat the dead. Um, and that enzyme, you heard of worm cases, right? When you're making your dirt or when you're going into winter, you want to set your soil up for uh, next year. Worm casings, the reason they work is not uh, it's not magic poop. It's the enzyme that is used by the worms, generated by the worms, to um, decompose what it's eating. And that enzyme sets up this biometric environment in your soil that causes these neat bacteria to grow. You are now working on a living soil. Once you go to a chemical fertilizer, you can come back, but it's a lot more difficult because of our lack of these organic materials in the soil. You're going to be making this dirt or buying this dirt to add to that. You don't want to be using, and you can pick a brand name, but um, Miracle Grow seems to be the nemesis, but it's only because it's common. It's chemical based. Now, if you were going into retirement, it's not bad to have some oil and gas stock in your portfolio, but you don't necessarily want it in underneath your fruit tree. And that's what it is. It's uh, chemicals from the, from the fruit. You have fluoride in your water that probably came from a plant that produced aluminum. And if they were to take that fluoride and dispose of it, they'd have to pay for hazardous waste disposal, or they can get the city to buy it from them and put in the water for you to drink to keep your teeth good. So there's things that are wrong with some of this stuff that you have to be aware of. If you want microbial activity in your soil and you go chemicals, you're kind of fighting yourself. You have to be, it's not I don't have anything against the people who make mineral cream. It just doesn't work with IPH, which is what you have up here. And um, it's high in salt. I had a gentleman test the soil the other day and he comes back with like a five. And he's well, fuddled because his tomatoes are doing terrible. And what he did, instead of talking about the tomatoes, we talked about his dirt. Well, it's they're in a raised bed. It's miracle burrow potting soil, and then he added fertilizer. So he's like double whammy. You're not measuring your real soil. If you want to get a soil test to know what to put in your soil, you go out into your yard and you dig like a foot down and you get unadulterated soil and you and you get that tested. And now you'll know what to add. Instead of testing something you've already added things to, it's a little bit more difficult because then, it, then you're chasing that. Where did you get that? What is it? And that sort of thing. So uh, when we tested soil for crops, what we would do is we'd go out in the field, we would get four or five bags in a um, four or five a foot down in paper sacks, send it to Nebraska where the kings of crops are, and then we would tell them what we wanted to grow, and they would tell us what to put in the soil. And that's a little bit elaborate for what we're trying to do here, but if you have healthy soil, then you can have healthy roots. So you can have healthy plants. And so we'll move into that. Uh, when you start to get problems with uh, your plants, we saw a, a leaf earlier this morning that had some rot on it. And um, that is possibly air pockets in the soil. When we mix our soils with our mulches, we tend to put too much mulch in because we're convinced this is crummy soil. And the reality is it's mineral rich and you're adding the humic via mulch and it is um, breaking apart that molecular structure that is the clay and it will uh, release, balance out the pH for the plant and the soil. It'll allow those nutrients that are in the soil to be released and the plant to pick it up. And a healthier plant 
to fight off the bug bites and the molds and the funguses and stuff like that. That will come because they just are here. The, the boring insects, and we're not talking about the ones that have no sense of humor, we're talking about the ones that bore into the trees, those are always with us. And we, the reason you see such a dramatic decline in some of the trees is the insects are always there. We have some drought or some stress, a, a dry summer, a real cold winter, and the trees die. And by the time you notice it, they're gone. Well, the, the insects are winning. When you see sap, it's actually a protective mechanism. The tree has enough water inside of it so that it can suffocate the critters that are trying to bore. So a healthy tree, a healthy plant, wins. You know, there's enough food for the critter to, for the uh, bugs to survive and, and do their part in the ecosystem. Uh, much like termites, you know, they eat the dead wood that's littered on the floor. So you want to keep that, think about your microbial activity in your soil. Don't put too much mulch in the hole. If you're making your mulch, make sure it gets hot enough before you start to distribute it. Taking that going into, yes. Well, if, do I know if bought soil in bulk is healthy soil? And uh, the first I would determine whether or not um, you needed soil. And I would do that by, if you have solid rock, like you're sitting on rock and there's no way to get into it, that's a need for soil to build up. If it's real rocky dirt and it's all decomposed granite, you don't need near as much as you think. And the ways around that is find a way to keep your erosion down. You can build up little walls, retaining walls or whatever, and, and add to it. But uh -huh. Well, I'll talk to you about that when we're done. That's not a long our bug and stuff line, but that, that's all doable. So inside of your soil, you now you have this living soil. You got these little organ organisms that are growing, and they are helping the health of your plant. Some of them are. And some of them are nuisance. There are bad nematodes. In the so science of soil, there's been some really great breakthroughs recently where people have gone in and they're testing the molecular structure of the soil and they're finding really cool chemical compounds that are bacteria that are helpful in killing bugs and killing uh, molds and fungus. And when you see bacillus on something, that's what it is. It's a bacteria. And then you have usually BAA or BT, they'll have a second word in there that uh, will tell you what it really is. But again, I encourage you to do your homework on that. There's uh, a fungicide this is a bacillus, the natural fungicide. And it is a, a bacteria that is, yeah, Amy something strain D747. But this is a bacteria that is going to eat the fungus as opposed to a copper. Uh, if you can see where I'm going with this. And, I, and this is just experience from here. Um, as we were getting to where uh, marijuana was um, more and more legal, we would have people come in and ask questions and you can knock it off pretty quickly um, that they're talking about their pot plants and they, they got a fungus pot and uh, they want to know what to do with it. Well, this, not just by its nature, is a whole lot cleaner than killing your, uh, the other fungicide that's common is copper. And uh, copper is not good. It's not good for your skin. It's not good for your lungs. Don't spray it on anything that you're going to put in the pipe and smoke. Don't spray it on stuff that you're going to eat. It's just, it'll work. It will kill the fungus. Great for ornamentals. Great for big trees. Not for what you want to consume. However, you're going to consume it. But again, on this is... Bacillus and it's Amy Thora something. You know, and it's discovered in 1950 by a Japanese scientist 
great work, really fun to read about, but start to try and use your bacteria as opposed to your chemicals. Um, and in saying that, if you, some of the names aren't going to have bacillus in it. They're going to be a compound that was found inside of uh, discarded sugar cane. And uh, that's uh, this. Uh, spinosad. Spinosad is a naturally occurring chemical, and there's a couple of different compounds that are put together for this, and uh, it's about as organic as you can get, and you have to eat it before it is a problem for you, and it will go through your system fastly, it decomposes quickly, and it's really not going to do the damage that some of the other chemical, just purely chemical based things are gonna have. It goes under a couple of different names and some of the ones that are synthesizing it have to call it something else. But um, Spinosad is one of the newer ones on the market that is just really, it was, it was actually launched over like 1985 by a chemist that was digging in a, um, near a rum factory in the Caribbean. And the sugar compounds inside of the decomposed discard is where he found the product. And it's great for this one is set up for worms, but that same product you will find for grubs, for lawn. It's a little bit more of a granular. Um, it'll set up as a systemic if it gets taken up. The product itself binds very quickly and very fiercely with your soils. And that makes it really safe for it's not going to leak into your wall system. It's unless you're pouring it down the hole into the well that goes directly into our aquifer, it's not going to get there. Plus, it's pretty benign. It's, um, there's tests that are run on these that you should be aware of. Some of them are on plants that are edibles, some of them are just general plants. Then there's aquaponics and uh, hydroponics. And aquaponics are usually a blend. They're raising fish and plants in a large body of water. Controlled, however, controlled, some not controlled. Sometimes they just do fences inside of sea bodies to raise salmon or something like that. But uh, hydroponics is when you're growing something without soil, and that's more of a contained, more common area. And they're running tests on all of these to make sure that they can measure the uptake. The other opponent to a lot of these pesticides is the molecular structure, the stem on your fruit, whether it's a tomato or a cherry, is your last filter. And you can have some of these uh, systemic almost, they're taken up into the plant, it makes the plant toxic to the grasshoppers and to the leaf uh, eaters and stuff like that, but it doesn't make it to the fruit. Uh, you could spray the fruit, wash it, and eat it, and feel comfortable about it. But it, it's not, and it's not really going to be so so detrimental if it's on your skin and stuff like that. There's some things you really do want to mask up for, and so uh, and I'd like to take a second here and go into some of the oils because right now there's um, we're, we're talking about fungus and we're talking about bugs. One of the common things that's used are the dormant oils, some refer to it. Well, there is a neem oil. Um, be careful about what you're spraying on your plants. There's a um, emulsifier chemical that's added to these so that they can uh, break down in water. So you're not just spraying oil. And as a general rule, without getting into specific oils, you don't want to be using them when it's hot. And I'm not talking about spraying them at night as opposed to during the day. If it's 70 or 80 degrees, you don't want to be using them. It'll burn the leaves, it, it clogs the pores. The original dormant oils we used to spray on, like, and Texas and other places where the winter was inconsistent, and you would spray the tree while it had leaves on it, and all the, causing it to go dormant. It would knock all the leaves, it would clog the pores and have all the leaves fall. Now they've come a long way with that, but you don't want this on the bark when it's hot. There's other ways of getting the same effect. The best time to use your dormant oils, your fruit oils, or your horticultural oils is in the fall before it gets too cold. 
as it's starting, as the plant is starting to go dormant, you're going to spray the bark all around it. And you're going to make sure that it's coated and dripping one time. That's, and then you're going to do it again in the spring when you start to see your first buds. And what you're accomplishing is a non toxic way of killing, getting a leg up, a head start on the bugs. These bugs will lay larvae going into winter on the bark, in the joints, flat on the bark, scale, all kinds of stuff. Rip. They've all laid babies and eggs on the bark and they're dormant waiting for it to warm up. And between the emulsifier and the oil, it breaks down the outside of the shell, causes them to suffocate or die before you have to use any toxins. I'm a big proponent of dormant oils, but if, you, if you're looking on your label of things that are um, fungicides, dormant oil suffocates the fungus. There's no question about it. But it also clogs the pores on your plant. So go to the bacillus for your fungal. Go to a bacterial, and the bacteria breaks down. There's, um, it's, it's really important this time of year because we are getting our humidity up, and you'll see white, white spots on your leaves. You'll see black spots on your leaves, and it's a watering issue. It's a bacteria issue. And if you go with your dormant, or with your oils, you have a problem. You, you set yourself up for problems. Then you, um, and read the label. Neem oil is one of the more common ones that people spec. And they will say, oh, well, it's a dormant oil. It must be neem oil. One of our dormant oils is canola oil. There's mineral oil, there's cottonseed oil, there's all kinds of oils that are used. Read the label, but just don't use it when it's warm. They're very effective. You might get by with spraying the ground because you could suffocate any critters that it con makes contact with. But this, um, there's a couple of uh, this spinosad is a really effective product. The fungus that is in the um, fungicide, the organic or natural fungicide is very helpful. Um, there's, when you're going into the grubs, I prefer the spinosam or the uh, chrysanthemum because the, because of the organic components and how it binds with the dirts and it's not going to, uh, it's not as toxic. It's not as toxic to you. It's not as toxic. It's a little bit more selective killer. You're still going to kill ladybugs and praying mantis when you start spraying things. So you have to make a decision. My garden's 20 foot by 20 foot with my edibles. And I had an explosion of ladybugs on the stink weed that's out in my field. And I would pull up the weeds and I'd go smack them together in the garden and throw out the weed. And, I, and they were just magnificent. I went out there one day and they were just gone. And I had potato bugs on my squash and I had grasshoppers on my, on my uh, sunflowers. And it just went, just flipped. And uh, what I've been able to do is I'm using the uh, pyrethrin-based product, which is from uh, the chrysanthemum, and I'm using diatomaceous earth. Um, this is really just small skeletons, very sharp, and it gets in between anything with an exoskeleton. They don't have a lung system. They breathe through their joints. And you clog your joints and they die. Roaches, um, pill bugs, grasshoppers. It's a little tricky getting them on the grasshopper. But beetles and all that stuff. Well, uh, I don't know the difference between a, a potato beetle or a potato bug and a squash beetle or a praying mantis or a, a ladybug. It's a bug with an exoskeleton. It'll work on ants. It's a great product for ants. Um, this come and get it is the spinicide granularized with something sweet on it to get to attract the ants. It's not anything specific for ants except for it attracts ants. So that's uh, it's still the spinicide. The, um, the chrysanthemum's a fun story in itself where there's actually a dust that was used for a thousand years. And it is the chrysanthemum dried and just powdered. 
and you know, it was used. It's been used as long as they discovered it's it's a, it's a thousand years old as an insecticide, as a preventive to put on you to keep fleas and stuff off in arid areas. The most potent is actually um, it looks more like a daisy. It doesn't have the the meat dome to it that we associate with the chrysanthemum, uh, and it's from Dalmatia and uh, they grow in the Eastern Bloc, and it grows at about five thousand feet. And that's the most toxic. And uh, you just hang the plants upside down, turn them to dust, throw it in your shoes, throw it around your yard. It's a great product. We found a way of extracting it and turning it into granulars and liquids. And again, it's a really, really good long-term use. You're not going to get sick off of it. Your pets aren't going to get sick off of it. We used to dip our dogs in it. Uh, the pyrethrin, pyrethrum, and uh, there's another one that is... It'll come to me in a minute. It's used in ointments to, you know, your uh, lotions to keep the mosquitoes and, and stuff off. It does minimal absorption into your skin, and you'll know pretty quickly if you have a allergic reaction, you'll just get a rash. It's not going to show you. But it, that is a great product organically. Um, hey, Kevin. Yes, sir. Take a breath and pass the sign up sheet oh, around, yeah. please. So if you want notes about, the, about this particular talk, even if you're on, even if you've given us uh, your email address at the register when you bought something before, but you want notes about this specific talk, put your name and address and your name and uh, email on there, and you'll get some recap. Uh, since we won't have a film necessarily, we'll say we'll yeah, no, out. we will. It's still live streaming. It's just live streaming through the you're smaller computer. I'm nothing. Yeah, you're smaller. Again. You're small. Um, the other way to combat this. Getting your soils healthy. So again, if you know what's in your dirt, you've done some tests or whatever, uh, even if you've already amended it, and going into winter, set yourself up for the stuff that has to break down over time. You know, people will want to use, I'm a big proponent of using, I eat a lot of eggs, and I, but that's next year's calcium. Going out and putting my eggshells in under my tomato plants, it makes me feel good, but it doesn't really do a lot. You want to put it in the mulch bed. You want a lot of it. So if you eat your dozen eggs over a couple of days, put them in the blender with some water, turn them into a milk, and pour it in your yard, it's still going to be next year. Uh, coffee grounds. Your little cup of coffees, you know, I, I, if you haven't noticed, I'm good for about a pot myself before I leave. And then uh, a pot at lunchtime. But that is, you know, eight cups, 12 cups is not enough. You go to some place that makes coffee and you get garbage bags full of it and you add it to your garden. Put a layer down. Uh, but this time going into fall, you prep your soil for spring. The things that you want to have in there, phosphate. Bone meal is phosphate. As it breaks down, it's going to bring this nitrogen as well. Blood meal, um, super phosphate, just granular phosphate. Aside about this and the health of your plants, one of the ways you're going to be able to to fight funguses is having healthy roots uh, and your bugs. Right, your uptake is going to be real important. Phosphate is the center number of your fertilizers. It's often used, well, it's always used to cause things to bloom. The technique is called pushing. They have a nice bunch of flowers and a bunch of plants in the greenhouses. They drop in more phosphate. They all bloom. They send them to us because they sell these and they push them into blooming. It's a root food with a side effect of flowers. You want to feed your dormant stuff phosphate in the middle of the winter or in the fall. So the only time those roots get to work for themselves and not support the rest of the plant is when the plant is dormant. So make sure that you're, whether it's a, Great myrtle that's going to bloom, or a red bud that's going to bloom in the spring, or a peach tree. Uh, make sure it's got phosphate to eat on in the fall. Your perennials will get bigger as opposed to just surviving. If you feed them in the middle of the winter, even though they look dead, feed them, feed them phosphate and give them a good drink. Turn off your sprinkler system to keep your sprinklers and your valves and stuff from blowing up. The plants still need the drink. Two feet of snow, there's all kinds of charts out there. You can look it up. There, two feet of snow is not enough water for to get a plant or a tree through winter. So especially if you've planted it, indigenous or not. 
Um, the other way, uh, and going along with that, putting stuff into your food, our fertilizer, and this is this isn't a shameless pitch. This is just reality. We, I tell people here, we're not here to display plants. We're here to sell plants. But if you're not happy, our end job is to make you successfully gardening and realizing that these products, that's what these products are developed for. Our 744, this is 644 with calcium, but it's an organic based so that you're embracing and encouraging that organic material, that uh, microbial organisms to grow in your soil and thus produce more of the proper enzymes and stuff like that. Once you throw chemicals on them, then you'll get results. You know, you might get a bunch of really good looking strawberries, but the soil isn't going to last as long. It won't be living, it won't be regenerating and stuff. You'll get to a point where you're really not tilling if you have a small garden. You're laying a, bulk, a, a layer of mulch on it and you'll plant your plant, you till that one little area and all that microbial activity from all the dead roots on the plants from the year before and the cool stuff you're putting in it will be growing and you'll just, you'll be amazed at how uh, much more productive you'll get once you get your soil into that kind of condition. The other thing that I want you to think about if you, you is what we call the spreading or the flittering of these diseases and the bugs. They'll go down a line. Uh, I don't want to plant anything monochromatic. There's bushes and things that we use just out of habit. Uh, I need a, a barrier wall. Well, I got to do red tip plutonium. You know, that grows real fast and real thick if I can keep the deer away from it. Well, it does. Uh, the issue then becomes if you get a bug on it that likes it, you have a whole wall of it that's infected. Right now, you will see with the uptick, once we get to 25 or 30 percent humidity, these red tip plutonia get this white mold on them and they look nasty. And you've got to get serious about them. You can't do it with a, with a bacteria. Uh, but I would rather see you plant something if you like red tip plutonia and mix some things into it that are also evergreen. That once that light hits that, it stops because it doesn't like that plant. It's, it likes red tip photon. So it has to do an end around, or you can actually stop them. And a couple of those are in the upright family, this silverberry. This happens to be a variegated one. It's um, uh, this underside is a different composition. So it's, uh, the silver helps to, uh, makes it recognized as a toxic to animals and to uh, bugs, but it also blocks evaporation. It's called aspiration. There's a time when plants breathed and they're releasing moisture at that time. As a fun aside, cactus is the only one that breathes at night. But um, there's also a, a solid green one of these silverberries that's real durable. These will get as big as your red tip petonia um, and give you some really cool color, not waiting for flowers. This is a cotone aster that will do the same thing. This will get seven foot tall. And it weeps, it acts, and looks like a pyracantha with no thorns. It'll have a nice little white cluster of white flowers and red berries. It molts. It doesn't go completely naked. It'll start to turn burgundy when it's putting on its new leaves. So it's essentially an evergreen. But you can keep it low or you can let it do its thing. Great for hiding a neighbor or a gas tank, something like that. This is in the same genre in the sense that it's indigenous to the area. This is called silk tassel. I had to thin these out. They were so many and they were so big on my lot up off the Copper Basin. Fabulous tree, almost indestructible. Really cool little silk tassel, purple berry that was very short lived because the birds all came in to eat it. I hardly had to pick any of them up. It was just a really nice plant. But mine in the yard were 12, 15 foot tall. They were phenomenal and dark, dark green. Uh, just and just weep with the snow laying on them, and then they would then they would spring back up. Yes, it is evergreen. Yeah, silk tassel plant is evergreen. So what I want you to think about is when you're reading these labels, get into the science of it a little bit. This is one of the beneficial nematodes I was telling you about. We used to get them in sponges when they were doing these experiments. And there'd be a billion of them in the sponge, and you'd soak it in the water, and then it would release them all. 
they found a way to, to put them into dry granules without um, killing the actual nematode. This is a great product for an early question that we had when we were starting uh, was we have a, a tropical hibiscus that's in a pot and we spray it appropriately for um, aphids before we bring it in in the winter and we end up with aphids in our living room. Uh, and that's, so again, we don't want to spray it with neem oil to suffocate the, we want to kill the aphids. Um, you know, instead of just suffocating the ones that are alive, you want to actually kill that. You, you can put this granular in the soil in your plant, and it will uh, eat the larva as they're starting to come out, and the gnats and stuff like that. It's a great use for indoor plants. It's a really good use for outdoor plants as well in a bigger volume. And you can get it at different levels. This particular brand, um, Nema Nights, spelled K N I G H T, uh, biological giants. They are biological giants, beneficial nematodes. There's bad nematodes and there's beneficial nematodes. It's a great organism to incorporate into your garden. But to your point about spraying a plant and killing them, if they're indoors and you have an infestation, I would go with the pyrethrins. And I would, if you bring it in and you find out that it is permethrin, is the one, it's the pyrethrin blend that they use to rub on, uh, put into lotions and stuff like that. You can take it outside, put it in your garage, wherever you're comfortable, hose it down, drip and wet, let it dry, bring it back in, and you've essentially killed everything that is going to be on it. And it's relatively non toxic. It's not going to hurt your animals. It's not going to hurt you. And then you can start with having something in your soil. But a direct contact pillow, uh, pyrethrin, uh, pyrethrum, those are the chrysanthemum uh, derivatives that you want to use. Inside of the uh, grub worms and the things you don't want in your soil, there's two particular things that I like to use. Uh, and it depends on how aggressive you want to get. Uh, this, it'll also be in here, oftentimes disguised underneath this word systemic. Um, there's two different ones. This one is, well, it's got a pyrethroid, but there's, um, uh, there's two, two of them that are, uh, there's two of them that are I want to make sure I get the name right because I'm not really good with the Latin. Um, Imidopid, imidopid and bifenthrin, bifenthrin. Okay, so the imidoprin is actually, hold on to your hat, it's a synthetic nicotine. And uh, nicotine in its purest form, very toxic. Has a lot of really cool side effects that we use for stimulating mental capacities and stuff like that, calming us down. But nicotine, when it's synthesized and pure, very toxic. And it's not really good for much. Uh, um, it binds with the soil enough to where it doesn't leach into the water, but it's a toxin that you don't want to. It's not good for humans. It's not good for pets. It's really bad for bugs. So if you want to kill the grubs and stuff like that, um, this will kill the grubs. It'll kill grasshoppers in your lawn. Uh, it will do the trick. You just have to be careful, judicious about your application. But if you are not having any luck, being kind and friendly to them and trying to kill them with the fly swatter, and you want to just you just want them dead, uh, the half life on is not bad. So it's easy to kill them and then start incorporating your organics back into your soils again. If you don't want to go that route, then look for um, some of the same systemic bug controls. Um, that will get into the plant, but it will usually have fruit and vegetables on the label. And that one is the other the sister of this, which is a pyrethrin. It's based on the same science and it's not going to, it costs a little bit more, but to me, the safety mechanism, the safety nest of it is a whole lot farther along. I will put this in my, um, squash, my fall squash, my hard squash, I'm using this like today and tomorrow. And uh, also I've got 
um, pin fruit trees. So I use this uh, for the grubs, specifically for the grubs, but it works also on the uh, rest of the plant because it is a systemic. Yes, sir. What's that going to do to your earthworm? Well, that's the that's a perfect question. This the pyrethrin base is not going to hurt them as much. It's not going to hurt them. They uh, it will. It's more for the shelled. The grub has a little bit different comp composition. Um, whatever they tell you, this will kill. So you again, you go back after it's done its thing. And you reincorporate earthworms into your yard, which is not that difficult to do, especially if you haven't before. If you want to go that route, and we should all love earthworms, because we don't have anything organic, there's nothing for the worms to eat. So it's really helpful if you want to lay some mulch uh, topsoil, which is mulch with sand. Uh, that's a winterizing mechanism that will put some other organic materials back in your soil that your earthworms can eat. They don't do well in just pure sand. Because there's nothing for them to eat, one organic material. This is one of my favorites to use. Uh, I've brought up the term before, but humic is uh, this is actually the humic acid. Humic is created inside the sweet spot of great big mulch bins or thousand year old forest on the ground, and stuff like that. This is essentially granular uh, compost, but it is humic acid. And you can fill this on your lawn. And you will think you fertilized. It's a soil activator. It starts that molecular decomposition that becomes clay. But that's the only way that that will help everything. It's not specifically for lawns. You, I use that instead of uh, the gypsum or the sulfur soil. And to go down that rabbit trail for a second, the gypsum works up here. And we sell it because there's so many people that have used it for generations. I got to put gypsum in the hole. And, um, you know, dad told me that about seven dust. Well, seven dust is pretty toxic stuff. And I don't want to use it. it it's a hereditary thing that I had to break. Um, gypsum was another one. Gypsum, it turns to uh, sulfuric acid on its decomposition, which is great for dirt. And it blows apart the molecular structure of the clay. It's a little bit more temporary. And the humic acid, sulfuric acid or sulfur soil does the same thing. As it breaks down, you get to acid. You want to acid your soil up here. You have high pH in the dirt, you have high pH in the water. That keeps a lot of stuff bound up. Molecularly, the acid blows it apart. We call this, a, I just go straight for the acid. That's why I use the humic. And I have great results. I've been uh, gardening up here for going on my sixth year. And I eat out of my yard. And uh, as well as a lot of beautiful ornaments, peonies, all the cool stuff you need to know. Yes, ma'am. If you put humic acid on the lawn, does it cause to break up the clay soil? Oh, yeah. Just the right. question is if I put humic acid on the lawn, does it help break up the clay soil? And the answer is yes. That's what it's, it's one of the things it's for is your clay soil. You mix it when, in your dirt when you're digging a hole for a tree or a shrub. You throw it around everything that you have planted and you throw it on your lawn and you water it in. So I'm going to get to watering as part of the issue, because that's a really common problem as we change seasons here. People just want to bump up the times on their clock because it's so hot. And the reality is you want to you want to train your plants to drink less frequently at a deeper rate. And uh that's going to cause less of these bad pathogens to be able to develop in your soil, as opposed to uh, if this plant, uh, this is a five gallon plant. It wants five gallons once every five days. A seven gallon plant once when you first put it in the ground, wants seven gallons every five days. Then you can go to every seven days or something like that, but you don't want to put two gallons on it three times a week because then you're going to keep this part of it wet and you're not going to get water all the way down to the roots and you're going to struggle with uh, rot in that top part that's damp and now hot and uh, if you don't put enough of the native soil in the ground they'll have air pockets and you're just going to perpetuate this root rot yes sir Established versus non-established. 
Thanks to Robert. Yes. Basically, to, well, they established versus non established for plants and watering. And one of the things that is absolutely non scientific about what we do is if it's not broken, don't change it. Uh, what you will have, though, is you'll have a sprinkler system set up and you'll put in a ringwood ash or a maple or a sycamore next to the lawn. And the tree will look great, but its roots will start coming up and sending runners out because it's dependent on that everyday watering, every other day watering of the lawn, and it's keeping its roots like this. If you don't water it deeply, it won't send roots down. And you'll have all kinds of problems with weather change and stuff like that with shallow roots. So that's, you got to look at it. The way I look at it is I see something starting to have trouble. And uh, pardon me, I've neglected to bring a piece of rebar, but I use rebar. You can use a moisture meter, which we have, on some of the smaller stuff because the prongs are shallow enough. But I'll get a two or three foot, three, two foot piece of rebar on the smaller side, and I'll run this down in the hole that I dug a year ago, two years ago, at a plant that was in the yard, the house that I bought. And I'll pull it out. And you can tell real easily, oh, it's dusty right here and it's standing in mud. Or it's really wet up here and it's foam dry down at the bottom. And you adjust your sprinkler accordingly. And what you want is a nice, consistent, the top is going to dry out a little faster, but you want consistent moisture in there. And uh, you want to make sure that you're getting all the, all the way down to the bottom. And you will, by topically adding the acid, you will start to break down the rest of it. The other thing, established versus non-established stuff, we all, trees are, uh, or anything five gallons or above, are really susceptible to this. I, had, I, can't, I see this all the time with aspen and birch, but it's not just indicative to them. Somebody plants it five years go by and, it's, and the tree's on its decline. And oh, I, somebody told me I shouldn't plant them here. They didn't work. And this is why. Well, this is 100% mulch. It's grown in mulch. And mulch, by its own, by its design, is meant to break down. And so, over a period of time, that mulch is doing what it's supposed to do. It's breaking down and feeding the soil and the plant. And you end up with air pockets around, right around the roots, because that's where the first bucket is. So, get a bag of topsoil. Or if you don't want to buy a product, go down in the creek bed and get some creek bed sand and pull the weeds out of it and pour it around the base of the tree with some of your organic based fertilizer and use that as an opportunity to water it in. You'll see almost all the sand disappear into those. You're, you're given that nice little snug blanket back to the roots with a little bit of food and you're back off to the race. You can really rejuvenate. A tree that's in decline by just giving by just giving the roots a little bit of attention. And don't forget your superphosphate with that in the fall, because that's root food, and that will bring that guy back. You come in when it starts to come out, take off your dead wood, and um, feed it quarterly, and you're off the races. Keep the plant healthy. Yes, ma'am. If you use the fertilizer, do you still need to use the bone meal, blood meal, and phosphate? No. Well, you want to use phosphate. The fertilizer is light enough, 744. Those are really light ingredients uh, and they're organic. So you want to use that quarterly because it breaks down quickly and adds to the soil. It's actually soil amending at the time. Uh, the phosphate is specifically root food. If you want something to bloom, you want phosphate. But I'm, I'm advocating you feed the roots phosphate for your trees and your shrubs and your perennials in the fall, so to overwinter it. But if you're gonna do this, when you're making your own soil, you wanna put these in in the fall, your bone meals, um, you've got chicken scat, you want your uh, you want your breaking down to happen during the fall. I had pure clay at, my, at the house I'm in, the dark's 20 by 20, brought in a caterpillar tractor, dug deep, flipped it over, got manure on it, do bone meal, blood meal, phosphate, gypsum, let it over winter, rain, snow, just left it alone, then tilled it in the spring and planted it into it. 
and let you know the organic start because there wasn't a I found five or six rocks. It was almost all just clay. And now I can run a piece of rebar down in the ground where I'm standing and it's just all starting to work. I almost I went out, I forgot to blow up on worms for a second. You can buy dried worm cases. Great stuff, adds enzymes to your soil. You don't have to wait for it to break down. You can go out and throw it around right now and water it in. You can buy, find some local, if you have treated with, you know, on a turf ranger or something like that, you're concerned that you've killed the worms in your soil. Uh, make sure there's organic material for the worms to eat first, and then get some fresh worm cases. There, there's local people that, um, Verminology with a V. It's all about worms. And there's verminists, much like there's rosarians, right? Uh, they will sell you a wet um, worm cases. And typically, it'll either be called wet or with eggs. And that'll have worm eggs in it. And you'll spread it out, it'll be moist, and you want to fluff it your soil a little bit, get it wet. Put that out, put some mulch on it, and hose it in, and let the worms come back around. And that's that's how you can kill something off and then come back around and reintroduce your organics to bring your souls back. I think they sell them to farmers. So she says they sell the farmers at the farmers market. You can get the worm casings with it that are live. So what about grass? How many times? So how many times a week should you water grass? Depends on the type of grass, but up here it's probably two times, I mean, uh, every other day. Yep. And, you, and if it looks a little puny, you get some humic acid on it and uh, some topsoil, which is mostly sand with a little bit of mulch. If you have spots in the grass, there's a couple of things that are happening there. You either have a large dog, <laughs> and or you've got grubs, or you have thatch where it's real thick and you've got some fungus working. You can put a fungicide down, but I have found helpful for that, and this was an old AM trick, was um, cornstarch or cornmeal. And you throw that out, and it uh, oh, just really works in, in the grasses. But there's a fungus there that the enzyme that's in corn as it breaks down kills that fungus. And uh, Instead of thatching it, you can just spread that out and water it in, and it'll work all the time. But if you got a dog or you have patches, the chemicals from the dog's urine are killing it, and or you've got grubs. And so you want to get some of this spinicide or some of the uh, chrysanthemum-based stuff in the yard to kill the grub, get some mulch on that, and water it in. If it's a big enough patch, you can put some seed on top of it. But the first one is, I've always understood that uh, now that it's got so hot, it's best to wait until it's fall. If you want to add any landscaping, is that true? Um, you're just going to have to take more care of it. Up here, um, if it's uh, container grown, is the term, uh, you won't see any burlap. You can plant any time of the year. It's just going to determine how much you're going to have to water it and whether or not if uh, if you see it sitting out here in the bright open area, you don't have to worry about shading it because it's, we bring them in for that. Uh, but in a container where we're watering them like every other day, in the ground, you don't have to do that. But you're going to want to get a planting uh, instructions and watering instructions from the cashiers on your way out. And no, that is not. Okay, so you can plant any time of the year. I just don't like to plant in the um, when it's cold, just because this the ground is frozen. Uh, the wind, the early uh, early spring and fall planting, uh, it's best to plant your trees and shrubs that have burlap around them. They were grown in a row and they're dug up and such the roots are damaged. They're wrapped in burlap and dropped in a bucket for transportation. And it's going to have a little bit more shock to it, and it's better if you catch it when the soil is cool. But that is that doesn't mean you can't plant them or you shouldn't plant them. It's just optimum at those times. 
Spray, spray them down, got them in the well, and we'll see if it's well. Talking about mulch and the bark, well, with my rose beds, I have them, I have the, the bark all around them, and I made a well to keep them away from the, the wood system. Um, for I think a water is, is that a correct thing to do or not? I mean, I'm especially. Uh, the, so the question is bark versus mulch. The or... question is, should I even put the, the bark around the roses? Well, uh, bark uh, for a mulch or decorative is yes. uh, versus a mulch. Well, just be aware that uh, bark hasn't broke down yet. It's it'll it will it'll take longer. Uh, sometimes it'll have dye on it to make it a consistent color. And um, but you're going to want to add a granular uh, nitrogen. Right. So I I then I, uh, I, I fertilize them late spring. Now, uh, a friend of mine said that they be fertilized again now. So fertilizing on roses, roses. Well, your for your bark. You want to throw a granular around the general broadcast. You right. don't need, you're getting it on the park. You're not getting it on the roses. And, and then on your roses during heavy growing season and blooming season, you're feeding every two weeks. And you're feeding a, a, a powder that you mix with water for immediate uptake. And that needs to be high nitrogen and high phosphate. And it is a chemical. And it's one of the few things, few times that I ad advocate once you start to do your homework on them, you'll realize that some of these chemicals will work for a lot of other things. So our flower power is minimal amount of salt. So that, but it is a chemical. And it is 12, 48, 8. 12 on nitrogen is great, but it's not going to leave it. Your, your need for the bark needs to be granular so it stays there and resides with the bark for a while. The, the plant wants to take up immediately, which means a liquid fertilizer. So you use our flower power. The 48 is root food and your flowers. And you start with it in the middle of the winter. And so it goes into spring roaring. You're going to take your rose when it's completely naked, and you're going to be able to identify. You might want to do it going into winter so you can see what doesn't have leaves on it. Or right when it starts to come out, you can see what doesn't have leaves on it. You've got to coat everything with uh, dormant oil in the fall and in the spring, and then take all the dead wood out. Right. And then you're and you cut it back to a few times, eight or ten inches off the ground, unless it's a vining rose, and you start feeding it every two weeks, and then it'll give you just like showroom stuff. Shoot. And I cut them back. So she's getting a lot of shoots as opposed to flowers, and that's a balancing act between your nitrogen, which is your new growth, big leaves, and green, and your phosphate. So be careful about the mix. It doesn't it doesn't hurt to have a general purpose fertilizer. When you go to general purpose fertilizers and you're reading them, 15, 15, 15, 10, 10, 10. All those even the exact numbers that are high like that, it's almost certainly chemical, as you're opposed saying, to organic. You're saying 12, 8, 40? 12, 48, 8. Oh, 12, 48. It's uh, the flower power. It's a scoop per gallon. Okay. And on your watering, here's a couple of, here's one of the tricks that I've enjoyed. I actually use, and... I, I will use, but I know I need nitrogen and I want to feed the roots. I'm in play, and I inherited three Deodor seeds, two of which struggled. And uh, what I started to do last year to bring them around was I would feed them our root and grow, and in the same bucket, I'm mixing our flower power, which is all of that nitrogen and the root food. And it's not going to flower. I wanted it to turn green 
and I wanted to put on new growth, and I wanted the roots to be healthy. So I gave a mature Theodore Cedar and a mature Maples flower power, and they came roaring back. I got the growth that I wanted out of them. I got the green I wanted out of them. And they went overwintered really nice in my spring growth up until it now has been just real nice. So there's once you start to understand the science of why you're doing what you're doing and you've kept your soil healthy and organic, then you get a lot of leeway. You could go, oh, you know what? There's actually a bacteria that will kill that critter instead of a chemical. Knowing that you're going to have to come back in with a clean bacteria to rejuvenate your soil, you should just start with a clean toxin. Poison. And toxin is like the difference between a wildflower and a weed. You know, it's only a weed if you don't want it. So using a drip system and using any of these products where you just sprinkle it around and leave it on top of the bark, how does it, how does that penetrate into the soil? So the question is, if you're using granulars, how do you get penetration into the soil when you're on a drip? And the answer is that's your opportunity to deep water. So you're gonna realize that there's an issue. You might have poked around, you find out that you have to adjust your sprinkler heads a little bit, and you throw your granular around it. Uh, the acid, just get it out of the bag. In other words, it's definitely not gonna help you if you take it home and leave it in the bag. You're not gonna burn that you get it out there into the soil. You take your hose and you start to melt it. And you get it, it you, you, whether it's the, the acid or the fertilizer, you break it down first with your hose, and then that then the heads will pick it up. It has to be in the soil for the drip system to, to activate it more. On the drip system, there's two things on watering. I'm removing my flags. I just carry some of my round heads with me, and uh, I don't go out and do it all at once, but I have a couple that are zero to five and five to 10, and that's gallons per minute. And when I'm working on a plant, pulling weeds around it, checking the soil, moisture, whatever, I'm taking off that flag because it's limiting. It's either on or off. And I'm putting a round head on it. And if it's a little flag, like a three gallon flag, then I'm putting a round black head on it that's zero to five. And I can open it up. I can close it down because I'm checking. Now I've made a habit of checking my moisture. And I know if I need to open it up, I need to know if I need to go an extra day. Do I need to not, do I need to stretch out from five days to seven, from three days to five days, put more on it less frequently and see what the results are. The other thing about watering is with uh, some of these indigenous plants, like this um, silk tassel, they might, or this ketone aster, this, uh, I mean, uh, Manzanita, this is actually a dwarf manzanita. I just bring it out because I like it so much. Real disease resistant. But this will go five or six feet. It'll lay down arms, looks like a wild manzanita. I just keep going. Well, it doesn't want to be on a grip. You can love it to death. It wants to go dry. But you have to be paying attention. One moment. So on my watering, I know I want to put five gallons on that. And I know I've got a fertilizer that's in the five gallon bucket. I want to put some root, do the kef trick. And put some root food in there with my um, uh, flower power, and I'm going to mix it in a five gallon bucket and I'm going to pour it on two or three plants. Count with your hose how long it takes you to put five gallons in that bucket. So, on my it's longer on my garden hose, on my hose that comes off of my house, than it is the, obviously the one off my well. 10 seconds or so to fill up a five gallon bucket on my well. Well, now I know that. So if I want to give my fruit tree an extra five gallons, I don't have to carry the bucket around. I just go over there and hold it out there for 10 seconds. And I know I got five gallons out. It's an easy way. Measure first. Take the time. How big is that really cool watering can you have? How many gallons is it? Well, I don't know. Well, get something that's a gallon and take the time to figure it out. And uh, you'll be able to monitor your Fertilizing in your water and better. Yes, sir. I have two questions. First, you're going back to the bird species. So, you have got birds that strike on the ground to lay trees? No. Second question that can be introduced to the tree to lay trees, but that also has to be a positive response. 
I'm sorry, what was that question? What you see here are the plots of the distribution that you see by the text here. So we have the Scotch pine, and I brought up having a bunch of nitrogen and phosphate to green up the Scotch, green up my Deodor cedar, and certainly uh, the reason I do that as opposed 